You're listening to Females in Fantasy, a podcast elevating the voices of women authors of science fiction and fantasy who write about kick-ass heroines. I am your host, Brianna De Silva, and this is episode two. Today, we are talking with Sarah Glenn Marsh, author of the recently released epic fantasy book called Reign of the Fallen. And it, well, I'm going to let her explain everything, but it is really cool. And it has a bisexual lead and lots of death. <laughs> and it is a, a lot of fun. And we really... It, this is a really, a really enjoyable conversation. We get to talk about different issues of representation and socially subversive uh, fantasy worlds. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. And without further ado, let's dive right in. Welcome, Sarah, to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to have you, especially because I am in the middle of reading your book right now. So it's always really cool to be like interviewing someone when you're reading the book that they wrote. <laughs> I saw your post about light weekend reading and that was hysterical. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely it's it's a it's an interesting book that has a very like almost, almost, I can't say fluffy looking co cover because it has a skull on it, but it's like pink and everything. Um, but it's definitely not a light story. Um, why don't you just, why don't you, since some of the listeners may not actually know what your book is, why don't you just quickly tell us, uh, what your book is that just came out? Sure. So my most recent book is Reign of the Fallen. It is a young adult fantasy. I would call it a uh, higher epic fantasy and. It's basically about a teenage necromancer. Her name is Odessa, and she lives in a society that is ruled by the dead that she is helping keep in power. Uh, and essentially, someone starts using the dead to create monsters, and her society starts to crumble, and she has to decide whether to save or help destroy it. That's a perfect summary. <laughs> so I'm going to jump right into the questions. The first one is actually from one of our patrons. Um, one of my patrons, I... Uh, one of the things that patrons get to do is they get to submit questions for um, the guests on the podcast. And I have a question here from Courtney. Um, and she says, Hi, Sarah. I'm loving Reign of the Fallen so far. Can you tell us about your writing journey from the first inspiration to the unexpectedly pink book on my shelf? Thanks. I love it. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, absolutely. So Reign of the Fallen began, oh, it must have been... I. Don't quote me on this. I think it was like fall of 2015 is when I started drafting it. But it was early on in 2015, maybe early spring or even winter when I first had the idea. And what was going on was my grandmother was really, really sick. She was in the hospital. She was bleeding internally and they didn't know why, which was super scary. So I started thinking about death and I, I'm really close with my grandparents and I was like, oh my God, you know, I've never lost like someone who's this close to me. And I started thinking about how far anyone would be willing to go to keep a loved one around uh, or, or bring them back. And, you know, my imagination took over from there and was like, oh, what would the consequences be? What would that process look like? And I wound up uh, thinking about the myth of Orpheus, uh, the Greek myth where he goes to the underworld to uh, retrieve his wife's spirit. And they're like, okay, you can bring her back to the, the living world. But the trick is you can't look at her until you're out of the underworld. But he got nervous and he did and he lost her forever. And that gave me my idea to start building my necromancy. Um, I spent months on the world building portion for Rain. Uh, on character arcs, on all different sorts of things for the story before I ever started writing. So it wasn't until the fall that I actually sat down to draft. And once I did that, that part of the process took about two months. I mean, it really just poured out of me. I think part wow. of that, yeah. No, that's fast. <laughs> part of it, I think, was the story is in first person present. So I felt really connected with Odessa and with her thoughts. And so everything felt so like, raw and fresh and immediate. So I went through about two months of drafting and then uh, I queried the book um, and that process also went fairly quickly. I think 
about two weeks, I want to say. And then uh, I revised a little bit with my lovely agent. Uh, and it was in early 2016 that I found out this would be a duology with Razorbill. Wow. That's a, that's a great journey there. Like It went really well for you. Um, that part did. I, I actually had... Um, I had a rougher journey with my first book. I'll put it that way. So Mm. I was extremely appreciative of how this process went. What was, what were some of the differences between, um, the process with this book and your first one? Oh my goodness. Where, where to begin? Uh, so first (laughs) book, different agent, uh, different, um, submission times, drastically different. And then I think too, just one of the key differences with rain is I was writing, my own identity for the first time. Odessa is bisexual and so am I. And that was something I really longed to see more of in fantasy. And so getting to write something that felt so honest was like really scary because it's like, oh, this is so personal. Let's send it to a bunch of strangers because that's fun. Uh, But (laughs) also it was fun. It was really freeing um, and it allowed me to feel more connected with my writing, um, doing something that was so personal. So that was different. Mm, yeah. And um, what was the, the name of your first book so that listeners can be aware? Oh, my first book is called Fear the Drowning Deep. And it is a it's also a fantasy. It's historical fantasy. And it takes place uh, in one of my favorite places, the Isle of Man. Oh, so since this podcast is females in fantasy, and I like to talk a lot about female characters, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your main character in Reign of the Fallen um, and kind of give us like a little bit of a, a little bit of a deeper dive into who she is and then maybe um, tell us some ways where she's like you and not like you. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> okay, sure. You got it. So Odessa, uh, she is 17 when the story opens. She is a necromancer, as I've said, and that means she has the ability to raise the dead. Uh, Odessa is very connected to her job. Like, her her job is a big part of her pride and identity. So in this world, uh, this requires a small, small sidebar. In this world, most necromancers are orphans. And the reason for that is that they don't have a bunch of loved ones that they knew in life, like, waiting for them in the spirit world so that when they're young, they can train without like being distracted. So Odessa is an orphan. Um, I was trying to avoid that cliche and instead I tried to make the cliche matter and be relevant to the world. So Mm, yeah, her job is a big part of her identity. And then her family really are her fellow necromancers as well as her mentor. She loves coffee. So that's something that we share. Um, (laughs) She's also very much in love with life. And that's something else that I really relate to about her. So, uh, and that's another thing that makes her a great necromancer. She loves nature. She loves just the sights and smells and sounds. She loves food. She loves dancing. She loves music. She loves like the vibrancy of being alive. And so that's, that's another way that I relate to her. Um, she's also stubborn as hell. And so am I. Um, (laughs) and yeah, I, I guess that would be a little summary of who she is. Cool, cool, cool. Um, so as you mentioned before, um, she is an own voices um, bisexual character. Um, what are some of the things that you see lacking in most bisexual rep um, that you like wanted to include when you were writing this character um, and just like things that you want to see more of? You know, there are already a ton of wonderful uh coming out narratives. And there are also, you know, more and more wonderful books, you know, where queer characters are just living their lives, but most of them are contemporary. Mm. So one of the things with Rain was I wanted to, I love fantasy. And I'm sure there are lots of other queer people who love fantasy and who... Mm, that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Like, all we want to do, right, is, you know, well, when I read fantasy anyway, I read it to not be in our world for a while. Like, I want my escapism. That's why I buy those books. So for me, what that looks like is not escaping to a fantasy world where queer people are persecuted because we've already got that. And so (laughs) that was another really important thing to me with Rain. So in their world, being queer is not an issue. Like, identity is not an issue in, in the Rain world. And while you could say, oh, that's fluffy or that's unrealistic, um, it's a world I built from scratch. So I got to make that choice. <laughs> and it, you know what I mean? It was mm-hmm. a 
choice I loved making. And you mm-hmm. just get to see these queer characters because many of Odessa's friends are gay and lesbian and bi as well. You get to see them just being the heroes of their stories and they have other challenges that they're dealing with. And I would like to see more books like that in the future. Yeah, same, same. It's always like, I find that there are a lot of like, if I really want uh, like a really good queer story, it's usually not fantasy. And then if I want a really good fantasy right. story, there usually aren't queer characters. And it's really, um, I, I always get really excited when I find a story that has both of those intersections. Cause it's like, ah, cause they're rare. <laughs> Absolutely. They yeah. are. And I just like, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of um, Game of Thrones and, I was actually, when I was building the world for rain, I was thinking about how frustrated I was with some of the choices Hmm. that he had made towards like women and queer characters. And I was like, well, you know what? When I build my world, I get to decide. And so that was really freeing and awesome. Yeah. That leads really perfectly into my next question for you. Um, So one of the other things that I really am appreciating while I'm reading the story is it's, it's very, like, it's also very egalitarian, you know, like there isn't, um, like queer people aren't persecuted, but there also isn't a hierarchy of gender that I'm seeing it happening where it's like, I'm seeing men and women in like all sorts of different roles. Yes. And as a fantasy writer myself, I, um, I ran into a problem I realized with, um, with something that I'm working on where about three drafts in, I noticed that I had a lot of like implicit biases that were sneaking in, you know, where I would like start to put people into certain roles. And then I'm oh, like sure. trying, it's like, I have to like very actively, um, for me, I have to like very actively think, you know, like go against that and um, kind of go out of my way to, you know, if I want to make this egalitarian, uh, you know, I have to like kind of really challenge a lot of like the cultural things just kind of sneak in. So my question is, did you encounter any of those kind of problems um, when you were, when you were writing your world? And if you did, how did you combat them? That's a good question. I really, I'm just so fed up with women, not women can do anything that men can do. And that's, that's only covering, you know, Two, two gender identities there, but right. I just, anyone can do anything. And I just wanted this world to reflect that. And I, I know that, I know our world is not going to immediately change to reflect that or that, you know, in the future, I'm sure we're a long way from that still, you know, given mm-hmm. current events. But um, I didn't really run into that. I, I guess, like you're saying, I tried to, I was just very mindful as I drafted, you know. Um, but no, I did not. I did not come across that. Yeah, that's good to hear. I, I'm hoping that's going to be me as I as I continue to write. I think I just wasn't. I, I think I just wasn't being mindful of it, like at first. Yeah. And um, yeah, so maybe that's the difference. So another, yet another thing that I thought was pretty refreshing about this world is that it's not Eurocentric, <laughs> as I noticed. Like, because that's something that we see in a lot of epic fantasy too, where just like everybody's white <laughs> except maybe True. like one side character. Um, and so I, <laughs> right? So like I appreciated yes. that. For example, our main character Odessa is um, not described as white. Um, so. And and I expect there's probably like other cultural things that I haven't really like run into yet in the story that are probably like from different sources or, or whatnot. I don't know. But um, tell us a little bit more about that and like also what the process was like for you um, while you were building your world and like different sources of inspiration, things like that. Okay, you got it. So with Cardia, um, one of the things, so Cardia is the, the kingdom where Odessa lives. It is, it's like an insular island nation. So it's, it's a large, I was picturing Australia. Okay. When I designed Cardia, I was picturing it is all one country, but it's, it's isolated, you know, by the, it's surrounded by ocean and, um, it is what it is. Um, so it's, it's isolated because the dead, it, they're afraid of change because death is a stagnant state. So hmm. the dead fear change, the dead can't change. Death is final. So they've, like, outlawed all forms of change, which means no trade, so no people coming in. But my vision for Cardia was that before that, it was a bit like America, meaning that it was a country where people came from all over to settle there. And then basically, mm-hmm. once these laws came into being of, like, you can't leave and no you, no one new can come in, that you had this melting pot of people from all over their world um, who had, had come together in this place. Yeah, that's really cool. Thank you. The other thing that influenced a lot of my world building was um, I did a lot of research on how different cultures 
treat death or view death. So like, Hmm. uh, you know, what are different, you know, what are different religious practices with death? What are different cultural practices with death from all over the world? And I was looking for things that would be really unique and striking. And I think one thing, I don't know, you know, how far you are in the story. I think you said halfway. So you probably saw the dolls, like where the the lower class has these death doll. Oh, Okay, well, it's not a spoiler. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so the people who can't afford a necromancer to bring ah. back their deceased family members have dolls of their dead relatives. And Odessa comes across a girl who has one of those. And so that might be, uh, it's like in chapter five or six. I, I do know. remember that now, now that you're <laughs> saying it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that was a custom that I read about that I was really interested in was the idea that people used to make, um, dolls in the exact likenesses of their deceased loved ones. And I thought, oh, well, my my lower class in the story who can't afford necromancers, that would be a really cool thing for them to have. And so I tried to shape a lot of my world building around death and the mythology of death. Uh, but then when it came to, as far as like Carthia's uh, climate and everything, um, I wanted a world that was, since Odessa is is so in love with life, I wanted a world that was very vibrant. Mm. Uh, And so what came to mind for me was a Mediterranean climate. When I think of of color and, like, richness of of food and flavors and senses, and uh, that was what I chose to go with. What were one of the biggest challenges with um, your main character and then also just, like, any other characters that were, like, the hardest for you to create? Or to, like, identify with? Yeah, that's a good question. So I would say the hardest thing in writing Odessa, my main character, was since it's first person present tense, I had to sit with her through a lot of really dark stuff. Mm-hmm. And again, I don't I don't, I want to avoid spoilers, but yeah. she goes through some really terrible things in the book, some tragedies that lead to... Uh, severe grief and addiction as a response to that grief and to have to go there. And I, I didn't want to be disingenuous and be like, Oh, I'm just not going to go there. She's going to brush off these things that happened. Hmm. I felt that the more honest way to tell this story was to go there with her and go through all of the bad things and feel them as, you know, let her feel them as deeply as possible. And so sitting with her through all of that was difficult, but I think was more honest to the story. Um, and then for other side characters, um, I would say one of the, Reign of the Fallen is a lot about, uh, gray areas, like (laughs) as far as characters, morality. And so writing the villain, and I don't want to spoil that either, but writing the villain, I agree with the villain's motivation in part. And I think everyone will, once that motivation is explained, they'd be like, oh, well, yes, that 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 seems necessary, but it's more the way that the villain goes about it that is so despicable. Um, and so writing the villain was challenging because at times you want to relate to them. Yeah, which I think makes some of the best villains, you know, what you feel like. Because agreed. Because like in real life, it's we don't usually ever experience I say usually. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of a joke. It's we don't really ever experience like pure evil, right? <laughs> um, we have moments where it certainly can feel that way and we don't know the full picture and we don't understand people's, you know, pat- their histories and their motivations and, and whatnot. Um, and I think people do pure evil things, but like there, there aren't people that are pure evil. Like we're so complicated. Um, and so I that really makes... I agree. Yeah. So that makes, that makes for the best, the best villain. So I'm looking forward to uh, figuring out who that is because I don't know who that is yet in the story. Oh, I agree. <laughs> and the villain, like, you'll get you'll get a little bit of why they do what they do, but you'll never get the full picture. And I think that that was, a, and that was a deliberate choice because I want people to kind of wonder what happened for them in their life that might have shaped the way that they went about it. And I leave that kind of open. So. Okay. So what was, what was your favorite? I know this is a, this is a terrible question, but... <laughs> <laughs> what was like? What was like your favorite part of writing this book? If you or maybe your top two, if you can't choose one, is this okay? You mean just like aspect or scene? Because I have a couple of favorite scenes that I can do spoiler free. Okay, actually, do scenes because that'll be fun. Okay, all right. So uh, I know you haven't gotten here yet, but one of them is the archery scene. So when you get to the archery scene, and you'll know it's the only scene where they're practicing archery. When you get to the archery scene. That was one of my two favorites to write. And then the other one, I'm going to 
touch on as briefly as possible, but toward the end of the book, Odessa gets in some really serious trouble. And she's in the spirit world. And the spirits who she has spent, like, her, she's dedicated her life to serving, they help her out. And I actually, like, teared up writing that one. I thought it was a really beautiful moment that they were, like, showing caring back to her. And it's it's a pretty cool moment. Uh, It's a turning point for her character. And uh, that was my other favorite to write. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for um, being on the podcast today. Where can people find you? So I am on Twitter at SG underscore Marsh, spelled just like you think. And uh, I'm also at www sarahglennmarsh.com and that's Sarah with an H and Glenn is G-L-E-N-N. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you again and uh, you have an awesome day. Thank you. You too. Take care. All right. Bye. That was my conversation with Sarah Glenn Marsh. If you want to stay in touch, you can follow Females in Fantasy on Twitter at Females in, and that's the letter N, Fantasy, where once a month we have a really fun uh, Twitter chat called Oh, hashtag females of fantasy. And that is actually where this podcast all started. It all started as a Twitter chat um, about a year ago. And uh, we talk about different issues of uh, representation for um, women in speculative fiction. And I hope you will join us next time. You, know, you can also follow me on Twitter at Brianna underscore De Silva. Thank you to Mireille Gash, who created the awesome illustration for our logo. Um, if you want to support the show... It would be really helpful if you could rate and review on iTunes. It'll help more people to discover it. Also, uh, you can become a co-creator at patreon.com slash females and fantasy, where uh, for as little as $1 a month, you can um, join our exclusive book club and also um, have the opportunity to submit questions for my guests. Um, every time I record something, I let all my patrons know a few days in advance um, who, uh, who I'm about to interview and uh, they get to um, submit questions if they want to. So that's pretty cool. Also, if um, you join at the $5 a month level, uh, there is an extra show, a, a short show, about 15 minutes long, uh, called uh, The Epilogues, The Females and Fantasy Epilogues, where I will have a kind of more laid back, sometimes kind of silly conversation with my guests. Um, for example, with Sarah, we played a game called Name That Necromancer, and it's very dramatic. You get to hear me use very ridiculous uh, voices. And um, you, as a listener, get to uh, uh, compete with Sarah and see who knows fictional necromancers better. <laughs> so if you want to listen to that, head on over to patreon.com slash females and fantasy. Uh, and we are this month, um, patrons and I are reading uh, a book called Not Your Sidekick by C.B. Lee. And she is actually going to be our guest in two weeks. Um, so I hope you join me then and it will be a fun one. I will catch you next time.